Welcome to this session, which is called A Waste of a Good Crisis, A Decade After the Crash. I'm Phil Mullen, and we're very pleased to have Larry Elliott here, who's going to be talking on this theme. Most of you will know Larry um, from his uh, many articles, weekly articles and others, in uh, The Guardian, where he's the economics editor. Um, Larry's also co-authored a number of uh, books, just mention a couple of them, which are on the bookstall. Um, most recently was Europe Isn't Working, uh, which is about the problems of the Euro mainly, and then followed up a year later uh, with the book Europe Didn't Work, <laughs> then with the interesting subtitle Why We Left and How to Get the Best from Brexit. He's obviously more optimistic of the timing than uh, as has actually turned out. Um, another great book uh, which is relevant for our topic this morning was first published again with consummate timing, uh, just before the apogee of the financial crisis uh, 11 years ago, which was called The Gods That Failed. It had a couple of different subtitles, but the one I've got here is How Blind Faith in Markets Has Cost Us Our Future. What was the second subtitle? I have no idea. It's no a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that set the scene for uh, what we'll be discussing, which is looking at uh, what's happened uh, since that crash what have been the lessons learnt and uh, what uh, uh, maybe we should be doing now. Now, in conversation uh, format is a bit different to others that you're probably familiar with. The way it works is I'll ask Larry a few questions and then about halfway through, which is about half past 12, um, I'll open up to uh, yourselves to uh, ask Larry things or to make com brief comments yourselves. So unfortunately, as you know, we've only got an hour here. So um, we will kick off. Uh, Larry, by the way, will have a few minutes right at the end to sum up his thoughts on the state of the world economy. Um, so, Larry, um, let's begin with uh, your assessment of today's economic conditions, both in Britain, if you want to focus that, or more, more broadly in the world. Uh, the IMF, I'm sure people saw, had its annual meeting a couple of weeks ago in Washington, and its new head, who's called Kristalina Georgieva, um, she declared that the global economy is in a synchronized slowdown and some other people responded to that and said, well, actually, I think it's a synchronized stagnation. So that's, you know, an official take on it. What do you think? Yeah, I think we're in a semi-permanent depression. A depression really means a sort of permanent period of extremely low growth and weak activity. Uh, and more than that, I think the solution to the last crisis hasn't worked uh, and the remedy for it has actually left the world in a very, very precarious place. Ten years before the crisis of 2007-8, I warned for an awful long time that the way in which the global economy was working was through the build-up of enormous amounts of debt. Uh, uh, a massive housing bubble, massive financial sector bubble, uh, and you know, lots of people said at that time, as they always do when there's lots of speculation going on, that you know, it's different this time. They're the four most dangerous words in economics. <laughs> yeah. uh, and you know, I, I'm by training, I'm not an economist. I'm a historian, uh, and I used a bit of just my historical background to say to people, well, you know, people say this throughout history. They said it, I'm sure in the 1630s at the time of the tulip bubble in Holland. They said it in 1720 at the time of the South Sea bubble. They said it all the times. Uh, the railway mania went, went belly up in the 19th century. They said it in the 1920s at the time of the, before the Wall Street crash. And they were saying it in the early 2000s that for, uh, there'd been you know, financial innovation, uh, diversification of portfolios, slicing and dicing of risk. All these things were used as reasons why um, there would be no uh, repeat of the bursting bubbles of the, of the past. And I just thought this was nonsense. You know, clearly, there was going to be a reckoning for this build-up of debt and the way, in, essentially, in which Western economies have been run, which was you know, give more power to employers, strip away powers from employees, uh, uh, neuter trade unions, uh, bear down on real wage growth, and leave people with the alternative of either having lower living standards or loading up on debt to fuel their consumption habits. This seemed to me to be a completely unsustainable model, uh, and so it proved. 2007-8, the banks uh, 
uh, ran into enormous problems and they wouldn't lend to each other, the credit system dried up. And at that point, the world central banks ran to, came to the rescue by uh, what they thought was a way of avoiding a second Great Depression. So they flooded the, uh, the world economy with cheap money, they cut interest rates to the bone. And this did actually prevent what looked like it was going to be a second 1930s from happening at that point. But all it really did was two things. It, it didn't actually lead to a long-standing recovery. Mm -hmm. It led to a, a, a virtual sort of stagnation of the global economy. And it's created another enormous bubble condition. That's what really worries me. It's not so much that the IMF says that we're in a synchronised slowdown. That's obviously true. But out there is another enormous bubble, perhaps even bigger than the last bubble, because effectively what we've had is 10 years of interest rates being kept at zero. We've had central banks which have just printed electronic money through the process known as quantitative easing. That has just, all that has done is not re restore any real health to the global economy. There hasn't been any fundamental reform of the global economy or of national economies. All that's happened is that people have been handed wadges of casino chips to speculate in the, in, in the housing market and in the financial markets. And the risk has been shifted from the commercial banks into what's known as a sort of secondary banking sector, mm -hmm. into hedge funds, into, into, into non-banks. But out there is just an enormous bubble waiting to burst. And okay, so, so that, put, that raises the question then. I mean, you're on record as one of the people who did see it coming um, uh, last time. Although, you know, I'm, I'm millions of economists, I know we're not economists here, we're writers in the economy, millions of economists say, yeah, we all saw it coming. But what you've described in terms of the situation today, it's, it's going to be very difficult for anyone to say, we don't see it coming. I mean, why, why haven't they learned from what happened last time? Because everyone can see it was a debt bubble that burst. And then, as you say, the way they've seemed to resolve it is to create a new debt bubble. Because it's just too frightening to contemplate, really. It's too con frightened to contemplate to what to burst the bubble to no, not let it continue no, no i think that yeah i think they they, they assume because it, the alternative is too frightening that the bubble can be deflated gradually and that's essentially what the federal reserve has been trying to do in the states by gently raising interest rates and then reversing it and then reversing it because as soon as this is what's really dangerous about it as soon as central banks try and take away the drugs the, the, you know, the, the, the markets just have a massive dose of cold turkey and, yeah. and they force the central bank, you know, the central banks in, those, in, that, in that situation think, well, you know, we know there's a risk of continuing with this cheap money policy, but if we don't continue with it, we are going to actually burst the bubble and there's going to be an almighty crisis. So they carry on reflating the bubble uh, over and over and over again until such point eventually i don't know obviously i don't know when anybody says they know when is lying but at some point if you keep inflating that bubble it is going to it's going to burst of its own accord no matter how much cheap money you provide there comes a point where people think these assets are overpriced these shares are overpriced these bonds are overpriced these houses are overpriced and they start selling them okay so we're on the same trajectory as you're saying that you described in the in the in the pre-2008 period take different forms, as you say, secondary banking and so on. But uh, what do you see? Do you see are there any differences now compared? I mean, do you think the conditions, the underlying conditions are stronger? Some people are saying, oh, at least the banks are better capitalised now, so there won't be a problem. You know, we must have learnt some lessons from 2008-9. I mean, do you, what, what do you see as the differences between this trajectory today and what you were anticipating? Yeah, I mean, we've learnt, obviously we've learnt some lessons. The banks have got more capital and they're more liquid than they were back in 2008. I mean, back then they were they were loaded up with, with speculative positions and had very little capital to, to back them up if, they, if, the, if the bets went wrong. They're now better capitalised. I'm not sure they're as well capitalised as they think they are, mm. given, the, given the size of the bubble. But the, bank, the global banks are better capitalised. Um, some lessons have been learnt, but I, I mean, my, my, my sense of where we were in 2000. And eight is that what was needed then was a real intellectual change of the sort that we saw at the time of the two previous crises. So if you think about the 1930s, when the Wall Street crash 
morphed into the Great Depression, there was a fundamental rethink of the way the global economy was run. So you had Glass-Steagall, which separated the investment arms of, and, and the commercial arms of banks. You had more power given to trade unions to bid up wages. You had, uh, had, the, new, had the New Deal, which became globalised through the Marshall Plan in, in, after the war. You had the setting up of the IMF and the World Bank to try and ensure that you didn't see a return to those conditions. And you had full employment embodied as the overriding aim of government policy. So you saw a fundamental rethink and a, and a, a, you know, a bigger role for government, uh, a rebalancing of the um, power battle between employers and employees, and, and, that's, and, and it really did change things. Similarly, in the 1970s, when the Keynesian mo that model ran into trouble during the, the oil shocks, you, you saw a really fundamental rethink. The, the, the neoliberal reaction to that had been long in the planning, but there was a fundamental rethink, and, 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 the, and the new right had got a critique of what had gone wrong, and they put in place some fundamentally different policies. Mm -hmm. In 2008, I think people on the left me included, thought oh, this, is, this is the moment when the entire neoliberal model, which has been collapsed. Which, is, which has collapsed and has been there for the last 35 years, this is the moment when we see some fundamental change. This is the moment when the, the, the left does what the right did in the 1970s and what the sort of social democratic left did in the 1930s, and it just didn't happen. So how do you account for that? I mean, that, that lack of response at the level of ideas, you know, the, the failure of a of I, Keynes I, or a Hayek I, or a... I mean, I think, there, I, think, I think there were critiques of... I think there were critiques of what had gone wrong in 2008. I think there was a Marxist critique, which was essentially said this was a, just an old-fashioned crisis of capitalism. I think there was a Green critique, which was we were pushing the world beyond its carrying mm -hmm. capacity. I think there, were, there was a sort of Keynesian critique which said that this was the result of deregulation of... Uh, of allowing capital to become too strong and essentially capital needed to be put back in its cage. But the, the, but the, the problem was that the, the, the political response by the social democratic left was so feeble. It bought, I think, I mean, my, my, my analysis is that the you know, New Labour, you know, Clinton in the US, the Social Democrats in Germany, the Socialist Party in, in, in France had become so wedded to the neoliberal status quo that their response was timid and feeble and the moment was allowed to pass so there was no there was no real political pushback at a, at a, at a, at a, at a political level at a government level against the neoliberal model and it, it essentially the, the what happened was there was a rethink but it was it was the wrong it was the wrong set of ideas essentially you know people like George Osborne filled the vacuum and said the problem here was the government had been spending too much and borrowing too much um, and the, 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 what the answer to the, to the problem was to actually retrench you know, for governments to tighten their belts and to actually do what was completely the wrong answer which was to reduce public spending, raise taxes and suck demand out of the economy. Now that was... Can I just take you back then? But when you describe the, the new ideas which there were in the 30s and again in the late 70s, 80s, I mean, those were, I mean, there were, there was thinking there and people writing stuff and so on, but it was also a response at the level yeah. of the political class. You yeah. know, you had politicians, whether it was social democratic, left wing democrat yeah. politicians like, like FDR or you had Thatcher, you had people with a, with a, who seemed to have a bit of a vision. That things had to be different. Yeah. And I mean, that, to me, that seems to be one of the, yeah, one of the main I mean, differences. I, the political, Elites just seem to be just caught in the yeah. I think, I think, I think they were just, just I think, I think they, they, just said I think they were just terrified of the power terrified. Of, terrified of the power of global financial capital. And so the the response here, I mean, I know more about the response here than in most places, was essentially to get back to business as usual as fast as you possibly could. So recapitalize the banks, bail them out, flood the flood the banks with money which they could use to 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 reflate mm -hmm. themselves. Um, but there was no. You know, there was no attempt to do what Glass Steagall did. There was no. I mean, in the 1930s, in 1936, after his reforms of Wall Street, Roosevelt said, "Wall Street hates me, and I welcome that hate." Yeah. You never heard anything like that uh, in 2008-9 uh, at all. I mean, the, the, and and the and, the, and the, the banking system of global finance played it very very c cleverly. So they sort of laid doggo for a little bit. 
pretended to be penitent about um, you know all the things that had gone wrong and said yes we made a few mistakes but don't please don't throw the baby out with the bathwater mm -hmm. we do a, we, we are vital to the economy you know and so after about a year of that you started to see some real pushback you know, you know we, we, if, if, against any real fundamental reform and that so what would you have liked to have seen in 2009-10 once the once things had stabilized what would have been your uh, I think that the agenda. I think the bank should have been broken up. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that the government here should have actually nationalised, properly nationalised one of the banks and used it as a national investment bank. Mm -hmm. And I would have reintroduced some form of capital controls. I think that the, essentially what the, su the success of the 1930s reforms was to actually put some sand in the wheels and give back nation states the power to actually run their own economies. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's good. That, that is obviously much, much more difficult than it was in the 1930s. But I, th I think in the end... Because? You think because of the power right, of because global capital? Because global capital has actually become a much bigger force. Um, but in the end, that is where... Uh, after the second... I mean, I th I mean, essentially, I think we're going to have another crisis. And after the second crisis, there is going to be fundamental reform. So all the, all the things... Where do you see that coming from? All the things that, that are now seen as off the agenda will start to come on the agenda. But it has to be people has to be leading that. And I mean, in terms of the political class at the moment, it seems even more distraught and disorientated and myopic than it was even. Well, I mean, it's not, in it's not entirely, um, you know, I'm not entirely pessimistic. I mean, there have been people. Realistic that, 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 <laughs> it has to come from somewhere. Yeah, I mean, there are people who've made the case for a, for a, a financial transaction tax, which is now back on the agenda. Um, here, if, if Labour does well in the, when they mm. happen to win the election, they would introduce a financial transaction tax. Uh, there, there are people who's, who, who are advocating, you know, people like Joe Stiglitz who are advocating. Uh, you know, uh, controls on, on on capital movements, and 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 even the IMF now recognises, in a way that it didn't before two thousand and seven, that actually governments that have got some um, controls on capital should actually be very very careful about removing them. So I think that intellectually, people are starting to 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 realise that you know, unchained global financial capital is an incredibly dangerous phenomenon, and you know, people eventually have to ask, who is benefiting from this? Where is the where is the evidence that actually allowing free movement of capital around the world is leading to <coughs> tangible benefits for ordinary people? I don't. Think you're, you're locating the problem at these flows of global capital. Yeah. I mean, isn't there a more domestic problem? Of course. The, you know, this productivity, low investment. You know, the fact that there's nothing being done within, not just Britain, but within pretty much every advanced industrialised country, nothing being done to renew their productive capabilities. So that gives a scope for these banks to make money out of money and so on and to float around. But there seems to be, a, you know, isn't there a more fundamental domestic structural problem? Yeah, I mean... Well, rather than just regulating the banks? Well, when we started with some regulating, I mean, I, my, my take is that the lack of any real reform in 2008 and the return to business as usual mm. has actually resulted in that low productivity, low investment, mm -hmm. low wage economy here. You know, that, Although, that, as you know, the, it began the, the, before the, 2008 yeah, with slowdowns in investment. It, it did, so it did. And, and, and the reason is that um, you know, essentially Britain is a country that you know, likes to consume, doesn't like to, uh, tends to under underinvest. Um, but the, the, the shape of the economy in the lead up to the crisis was one in which people were fundamentally living off the asset value of their houses. Mm -hmm. uh, so people and debt, yeah. and debt. Yeah. So, so you're using your house as a as a as a cash point. You know, as it went up in value, you extracted some money from it and used it to buy consumer goods. Uh, parts of the country, particularly the northern regions, there the model was uh, public spending where the government creamed off the revenues from the housing bubble and the financial bubble and redistributed it to the northern region in terms of higher public spending. Now, when, the, when those two engines stalled in 2008, the public spending dried up. So, that, 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 so effectively, the, the model of the economy that was, was there before 2008 collapsed. But, but those were showing the limits of debt, weren't they? Yeah, exactly. Which is why I'm saying that just re 
just going back to the business as usual model was a dead end. And so it's, so, yeah. it's, so it's proved so that yeah. we've had effectively, and people, you know, if you, if you account for inflation, people's wages are still lower than they were in 2008. So we've had yeah. a lost decade of wage growth, we've had a lost decade of productivity growth. Uh, and, you know, even... And that's, that's why people were taking money out of their houses and stuff. You know, if you're not getting wages, you, you can't blame people for borrowing money or for no, living on their assets. I mean, pe yeah. People have gr grown used to the idea that they should get better year on year. Yeah. Uh, and if their living standards are going down, they'll find, a way of ways of find other ways of doing it. Yeah. But it does, the, all that suggests to me is that the model that we had in 2008 was not fit for purpose. And the fact that we've just tried to keep this you know, old jalopy on the road for another 10 years has just proved that point. It's still, it's even less fit for purpose than it was in 2008. Yeah. And, and, and the last decade has proved it. So we need a different model of political economy. Okay, know? which comes back then to how do, you, how do you bring about that different model? I mean, you can write it um, with colleagues and stuff. You can have an idea as to what that would contain. But, but what's to stop the same thing happening in 2000 and as happened in 2010 that they'll just say, well, you know, we're too addicted on debt. We'll try and manage things through another couple of years. We'll try and muddle through again and then we'll be into another cycle. How can we be sure that's not going to happen again? Or can we be sure? Is it possible? <laughs> well, I mean, what, what should we do? I think, I mean, I, I don't. I don't think it's possible to say it won't happen again. I mean, mm. it, it will depend. You know, Milton Friedman once said, "You know, the, the response to any crisis depends on whose ideas are around at the time and who who's prepared to yeah. actually run with those ideas." I mean, that that, that I agree, totally agree. Yeah. You know, so the response to the crisis will depend on which group of people has the best and most you know, <coughs> you know, appealing set of policies for dealing with it. I mean, my my, you know, just if you you know. From what I've said so far, I think there are certain things that need to be done. One is that we need to actually tackle a grotesque lack of investment in mm -hmm. you know, not just public infrastructure, infrastructure, but just renewal of our of our private private investment. So that you know, there's there's a case there for uh, you know, the National Investment Bank. I would have thought uh, there is a, uh, a a desperate need for. Um, some form of geographic rebalancing of the economy. So I mean, I, I'm part of a Green New Deal group which talks about retrofitting people's homes, providing jobs in every constituency, trying to actually sh change the shape of the way in which we do energy policy to make it greener, using our northern universities as, as hubs for uh, for those, for, for, for maybe for each, each of a form of, of, of new green industry. I mean, those are some of the, those are sort of two of the ideas. I mean, I think that you know, it's and, and we have to actually do something about the the banks. I think. And, mm -hmm. um, I mean, we haven't seen the manifestos yet. Uh, the election's just called. But is there anything inklings you get from any of the major parties that you think would help move down the road that you're describing of the sort of structural changes that are required on the economy? Well, some of the things Labour, I mean, I, some of the things Labour are talking about would go down that route. I mean, they're talking about a national investment bank, which I think is a good idea. You know, they're talking about a Tobin tax, which I think is a good idea. I mean, they've got, um, it's, it's just, it's, I, I, but I, I don't actually think any fundamental change is going to happen until we have another crisis, essentially. I think that, I think, you know, I think, I think in the 1970s, change really came after the second oil shock, not after the first oil shock. I think that's when the Thatcher and Reagan reforms really became salient because people thought, well, you know, one crisis is, is, is one thing, but having two within five or six years, and I think, you know, we are, we are, a, we are we, something more serious. Something more serious is, is, is going to, you know, essentially, the crisis of 2008 was not fundamental enough to occasion the change. The, 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 what people were talking about, you know. The yeah, but essentially they put the sticking plaster on it and they kept and, and kept it and kept the, the, the system going. It, there wasn't a, there wasn't a, a syst the, this crisis wasn't systemic enough uh, to actually lead to that change. I think that probably we need to have that fundamental change. And I'm, I, I, I think it'd, be, it'd, be, it'd be very, it'd be very, it'd be very nice for me to think. Okay, well, rational people should say, well, look, 2008 happened. 
we're now 10 years on there's been no there's been no real pickup in the global economy everything is slowing down all the things that people thought were going to be avoided in to, in 2008 such as the return of protectionism anti-globalization has started to happen as people have, have started to say look this model is not working for us so it, everything to me screams crisis alert and, 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 and it would be nice to think that in, that in those circumstances, rational people would sit down and say, well, here are the, you know, here is a broad range of policies that we need to actually put things right. You know, so we need to actually, you know, the, another thing I would suggest is that needs to happen and happened in the 30s is that if you want to stop the economy being so dependent on consumer debt, then you need to give consumers uh, you know, uh, higher real wages and therefore you have to change the balance of power between employers and employees and actually have stronger trade unions. Now, uh, uh, is that going to happen uh, without some it, without something happening first? I, I, I'd like to think so, but I don't, I'm not sure it will. So, you know, yeah, you, but know then put, you put controls on the banks, you, 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 you use the state to actually use the power of the nation state to invest in what you think needs to be done, both publicly and privately. Uh, you... Uh, you, you put some controls on capital, you, you'd go some way to actually fundamentally changing the model in the way that it was in the 1930s. In some ways you could say that, you know, waiting for the next crisis to happen to sort of force change, it's too late by then because, I mean, I think you and me probably both agree it's going to be, we'll take different forms, but it's going to be equally cataclysmic as the last one. You know, the, the bubble's just as big, you know, the imbalances are just, uh, just as great, if not greater. Uh, the underlying economy is weaker than it was then. So by that stage, it'll be like all hands to the pump yeah, or whatever, okay. rather than wouldn't it be better now to try and actually work out what that alternative program should be? And Absolutely. Totally agree. I mean, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't dispute I, that. I, 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 wouldn't, uh, happen I, I, I wouldn't dispute off that. The agenda, I mean, yeah, it's just that maybe I'm so old and <laughs> cynical that I just don't think, is, you know, I, I, while things are trundling along, you know the economy is yeah, not. I mean, the global economy is not collapsing. It's growing at three yeah. percent a year. The UK economy is trundling along at one and a bit percent a year. You know, there's you know people. Yes, but as you say, every IMF report, every no, no, no. OECD report, every is all saying. I mean, they all know that this is not going to no, carry in, on. In five years' time, after the bubble has burst and, yeah. and another and the world is back into recession, it's going to be no point in saying, "Oh, well, this is a bit of a surprise," because it's not a surprise. No. Uh, it's, it, it, no, it's, well, that's even worse. I mean, they could get away with saying last time, "Oh, we didn't see it coming." Very sorry. You know, we'll jump in and put all this liquidity around and QE and stuff, and we'll stop it becoming the Great Depression again. But, you know, they can't, as you say, they can't say that this time. So what they're saying to us is effectively that we can see there's a big crash coming and we're just trundling along towards it. And it's just, it's this old thing about, you know, kicking the can down the road rather than actually trying to do something now. It's just, as you say, just hoping that it'll carry on for another few months and hopefully some other politician will have to deal with the mess, you know, in two years time. Yeah, that's pretty much up there. Fine. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that pretty much sums it up. <laughs> okay. Over to you guys then. I'll take about three or four at a time. What do you think of the proposals for a land tax? Because that's quite radical. Uh, most European countries have it. And it would be a way of raising quite a bit of money and changing the social dynamic, really, if everybody had to pay tax on the, the size of land they had each year. Given that 97% of the money supply is created by commercial banks, would it not make sense if um, we were to democratize, say, 50% of that and allow uh, it, commercial banks just simply loan to property and assets, which just fuels the rent rentier, non-productive economy? So wouldn't it make sense to take half of that money, well, if not all of it, and democratize it and use it for things that society needs, loans towards hospitals, uh, tuition for uh, students, rather than just asset prices and house prices, which we have okay. now. Thank you. Very uh, short and a uh, naughty question. Uh, what do you think of the principle of creative destruction? You, you talk about the next crisis. I mean, the, the ten-year-old crisis was a banking crisis. Just wondered on your thoughts as the likely candidate for the next crisis in this country could be the housing crisis. There's still wide belief we're on the housing ladder. It wouldn't take much to shift it to the housing snake. 
And is that likely to be a candidate for the next crisis? Yeah, I mean, it's, it sort of follows on a bit from the creative destruction um, kind of discussion, because one of the problems I always hear about a lot is that is the lack of productivity. And every kind of meeting that I go to, everyone is very serious about finding ways to improve UK productivity, but it's always a kind of nice thing. Everyone kind of wants it. It's kind of all just invest in a few things. And obviously, in reality, there's probably going to be a lot of pain involved in getting rid of unproductive ones. Um, and it seems like one of the problems of the last crisis is there was an awful lot of pain for people, but there wasn't much creative pain. It hasn't really gone into any purpose. So can I just ask to be a little bit more specific on where you think some of the actual pain might come from that might be useful uh, in future? Where are sort of some of the companies that don't exist anymore, should, maybe shouldn't exist anymore, that might have to be moved away for newer ones to emerge from? And where does that... Be, where can we be a little bit more specific about where that might okay, happen? Thanks, got you. Okay, thanks. Let's take the housing market first. I mean, there's something fundamentally wrong with the UK housing market because, you know, we've had the last, I don't know, since I was 18, I think we've had four major housing bubbles and four major housing crises. You know, we should have learnt by now that running the economy on the basis of perpetual housing bubbles is not a particularly good way of going about things. Um, and I think, there, you know, this is quite a small country. It's got quite a high population. And it's under, it's under, it's under tax. The housing is under taxed. You know, it, we, essentially, you've got a problem where this, the demand for housing is going to go up and the tax system encourages that, that over, over uh, investment in the housing market. So I'm totally in favour of changing the tax structure of the UK housing market with that I, I'm quite wedded to the idea of a, of a, of a, of a, uh, a land value tax but I could see the case for um, you know putting capital gains tax on prime residences as well uh, you know I think that there, the, we actually need to actually wean ourselves off the idea that having perpetual housing bubbles and house price inflation uh, is a great is a great idea I mean if, when you talk to a German and say that um, you know, our house prices have gone up by 300% since the early 1970s and theirs have gone up by about a third of that, if any, you know, maybe 50%. Uh, they would say that that, that that is a sign of how deformed our economic model is, and I think that's right. So I mean, I, I, I'm, t I'm totally um, up for a land value uh, tax. Um, the, the idea of you know, money creation, I think that one of the things that's going to change uh, or sh it should should have changed in after two thousand and eight was that essentially the, the the what I see as the problem is that the the money that was created by the central banks through quantitative easing, which was effectively to make up for the fact that the banks wouldn't lend to each other and were actually withdrawing credit that that was a sort of it was in in a way a missed opportunity because that money that the banks w were creating just went in splurged out into the into the commercial banks which they lend uh, were supposed to lend on for productive purposes but essentially just lent on for speculation in shares and bonds and houses so i think that when the next crisis comes then that needs to be a politicization of that quantitative easing and it should be used as you know, at, people talk about helicopter money, but essentially it should be used to 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 pay for uh, public investment in things that we need. So you know, the Green New Deal group, of which I'm part, says that one of the ways of financing that should be through green quantitative easing or people's quantitative mm -hmm. easing. So that would be that would be my answer. To that. Uh, what was the other? What was Creative it? destruction. You had a couple of questions. Huh? Um, yeah, I, I think that what's happened is that, you know, if you look at it in terms of big technological changes, we could be on the cusp of, a, you know, of, of a, one of those big once in every 60, 70 years changes that Kondratiev talked about in the 1920s. I mean, he essentially said that, you know, the world economy moves through these big technological shifts. So, you know... First Industrial Revolution, coal and steam power. Second Industrial Revolution, electricity and steel. Third Industrial Revolution, digital and computers. Uh, and we are now 
potentially on the cusp of uh, a fourth industrial revolution based on you know new technologies robotics ai genomics and so on and i think i have some uh, environmental technology i have some sympathy for that but i think that what what's happened is that the low interest rate environment has kept alive a lot of zombie companies and has actually probably holding back that process i think you know creative destruction is part of the way in which economies develop i mean you need to actually think about you know the new replacing the old and it, if if the old is kept in place past its sell by date then it, it it becomes more problematical for the new to arrive and i think that one of the reasons that we are where we are in terms of low productivity is that we are not yet reaping the real benefits from the new technologies and the new industrial processes that are out there waiting and could be could could could, could form the basis of a stronger and faster growing economy so that is that all the questions or have I got yeah that'll do we can, we'll take a few more the organization i'm from is uh, grand northern uh, you're right on the money you really are but we are in a kind of an addictive cycle of 10 years boom bust you know yeah and and we've got to change that and you mentioned a few points there about uh, control the capital movement which is very interesting and the grotesque lack of investment in infrastructure absolutely right do you think we should be following the uh, german model and maybe the japanese model to get us through the next uh, recession to do with what investment you're talking about? Uh, well, where I'm coming from is um, when you say the German you, you model, you talk about the investment Japanese... bank, right? Okay, we talk okay. about let's let's think about, for example, I can main, name many, but DHL. You know, they're the biggest yeah. company, parcel company in the mm -hmm. world. They're an American company. They were bought out by Deutsche Post. Deutsche Post is owned by a German bank, twenty-five percent. The German, the German economy is such that they are now offering bonds at a negative interest rate to store your money. Right, right so point. you gave your money to those the, the bank and they then give it to DHL, which is Deutsche Post, which is now as the royal warrant, incidentally, okay? And they're able to go and sweep up all these companies. Do you think that's a level playing field? Okay. All right, thank you. You've criticised the internationalisation of capital and finance, but I wonder if there's also a critique to be made of the internationalisation of trade and goods just that everyone talks these days about free trade agreements as if they are an unalloyed good. And, and I'm just not sure about that. And following on from that, is there anything positive to be said for what Trump is doing in terms of imposing tariffs on goods coming from, say, China and the European Union? Uh, so I, I see two big challenges, which I think, you know, always get swept under the carpet. So the first one is, uh, if you're serious about a new deal, you've got to face up to the, to the, the woeful record that we have in the UK and indeed most Western economies of, of public investment right and that's that you know and you've got to get over that politically and you can contrast it with how they do things in Asia where they have a much better record and frankly a lot less democracy and they also uh, they give over that public investment decision to a class of technocrats okay another unpopular idea and the second one I'd say is that uh, Again, something the left never wants to face up to is the structure of, um, of public spending in, a, in an economy like the UK. So everyone says, well, we need to spend more on investment, but nobody really wants to face the fact of you know, the very poor quality we've got of, of public spending and the uh, considerable amount of transfer payments. So we've got you know, massive unfunded pensions. And because we've got no public housing policy, we've got massive housing benefits. As long as those items are continually clogging up your balance sheet, you really don't have much scope for, for fiscal spending. Hi. Um, since you clearly had the foresight to see the financial crisis in 2007, 2008, do you have any speculation for when the next one will be to the same level? Sorry. Do you have any speculation for when the next financial crisis will be to the same level of the 2007, 2008? Yeah, I'll start with that one. I mean, um, the short answer is, if I knew the answer to that question, <laughs> I, I, I'd be out there making a mint of money. <laughs> uh, I, 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 you know, I don't think anybody, anybody can say with any, any assurance when it will be. I mean, I, I just think you just, and, 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 and you know, some people say, well, for the last 
50 years there's been a serious recession or financial crisis once every 10 years it's been the it's been 10 years since the last crisis ergo we're we're due one right now i mean i i think that's far too mechanical you know there's a long period between the early 1990s and 2008 when um when there was it, everything seemed to be okay and it, that was a long period so it could it could be a, a, a prolonged period this time it depends on you know but, but even even in that period it was like I mean, my, my assessment was it was like watching someone who was overweight and had a very bad lifestyle have a series of mini heart attacks uh, and not changing the way they behaved or, 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 their, or, their, or, or, or their lifestyle. And eventually you ha the, the, the global economy had a major heart attack. So I think the gr what we're going to see is a series of mini crises, um, but they will be different from the last one. So, you know, going on to talk about... Tr Trade is one example of a malfunctioning global economy uh, that could easily trigger if if the, if that if that developed into a full scale trade war that could easily be the trigger for uh, a, 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 a massive financial crisis. And, you know, I, I I agree with the question about global uh, internationalisation of trade. I'm not. Uh, I think only only uber capitalists really believe in the total free movement of the factors of production. Uh, you know, if you think about who really supports the idea that uh, free movement of capital, free movement of labor, free movement of goods and services, the people who tend to believe in that are multinational companies and neoliberal think tanks. And the European Union. Yeah. And the European Union, exactly. Uh, uh, so, you know, I'm not, my views about the European Union are well documented, but <laughs> I mean, I don't, the four freedoms to me are a misnomer. Uh, uh, and so I, I, I think that one of the reasons that the period after the Second World War was so successful and was so, and growth was democratizing that it actually was not just growth for the for the one percent or the ten percent, but growth for everybody, was that nation, nation states kept quite strict controls over the levers of power in their economy. So trade was liberalized, but liberalized in a very gradual manner and in a, in, 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 in a, in a managed way. Capital flows were controlled, immigration was controlled also. And therefore, once all those, once all those controls were lifted, you, 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 had a, a, you had the development of a much bigger global economy. And yeah, my, my, you know, I think we're now seeing a backlash against that because it's quite clear to me that that global economy has been beneficial not to everybody but to a much smaller group of people than the nation state full employment economy it replaced. Uh, well, Jeff Bezos. Uh, yeah, Jeff Bezos. <laughs> global, I, I mean, I, I think it's, it's German model, Japanese model. I mean, I think clearly we have lacked the infrastructure that um, Germany has to actually support its manufacturing base. I mean, they have much more patient capital, they have a system of regional banks, they have a system of industrial banks that support their industry. And I, uh, 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 Do that, we have that? No. Exactly. No, we don't, we don't have that, and we have uh, banks which really see their the way of making money is out of the housing market. That's the easy way to make money, uh, and that's where they do, that's where they push most of their investment. Uh, I, I totally buy the point from the gentleman who said that you know we have a problem with public investment, and you know if we want to, we have to ask some serious questions, which is that too much of our public spending goes into current spending on wages and salaries. And that leaves too little left over for long-term productive investment. If we really want to have a, 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 a better economy and a faster growing economy with higher productivity, we have to recognise that the way to do that is to invest in capital, be that private capital or public capital, and that actually just pushing resources and excessive resources into current spending is not a way of growing the economy long term. And I think that's an absolute, you know, that has been a fundamental weakness of our economy for a very, very long time. And that, going back to the gentleman in the front, 
view, other countries have actually worked that out in a way that we haven't yet. Okay. So yeah, in general, what would the economy look like um, after a crash as we're building a new system? And more specifically, you're talking about nation state economies. But do you think Anthony Giddens was right when he said globalisation was irreversible? Um, can we get back to that? Because I appreciate what you're saying, but how do you envisage it looking, considering what we've got now? So it's quite a simple question. Are we the problem or a significant part of the problem? Um, it's, all, it's all well and good saying governments need to do more in terms of uh, bringing about new policies. But the fact is, some of these changes would also hurt the pockets of people that currently benefit from this current system. And if it had such public support, surely they'd already have these policies in place. So do we, as a populace, are we, the fact that crash hasn't yet happened, is that the reason we're not quite yet ready to swallow that pill that might not taste too good, but might be what we need to secure a better, more secure future? Yeah, I wanted to say thank you, Larry, for taking on so many uh, sort of sacred horses, I thought. It was very good to hear. But I had a sort of a more technical question, or two very brief ones. Firstly, you talked about creative destruction and the need for it. And I agree, there's far too little of it in today's society in the UK, too many vested interest groups. But I would have thought trade unions are an example of a group that normally fight for stability in the status quo and aren't willing to see all their members fired on the basis of they'll get good jobs when we reshape the economy two years later. Secondly, just as a more, you know, in the description here, you talked about getting rid of a new normal. But I was thinking, uh, what weight do you put on demographic factors leading us towards perennially low growth, lower interest rates, and so forth? Because just very quickly, the Bank of England recently looked at the rise in house prices since the 1980s and the fall in interest rates. And they concluded that three quarters of both the rise in house prices and the fall in interest rates could be explained by the UK's changing demographic structure. And then just very quickly, finally, on QE, you talked about uh, a green investment bank. But it doesn't seem like sort of counter-cyclical measures that would be needed in a crisis uh, when rates are already so low. So do you have any ideas on how the central bank could counteract next crisis? Thank you. Sorry. Nari's coming back, and then we'll hopefully take one more round. Yeah. Uh, OK. Um, what would... What will the economy look like post-crash? Well, pretty bad, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thanks, guys. Um, I don't buy the argument, the Anthony Giddings argument, that anything is irreversible. I think that globalisation is the result of, as, as, as almost everything is, is a result of political choice and political uh, uh, decisions. Um, and I think one of the reasons that we're in such a pickle is that people like Tony Giddings really bought the idea that you know the state of the world is a bit like the state of the climate that is you know or the state of the weather that there's nothing you can do about it that essentially it's like a blizzard or a or, or a period of high high pressure or something that you can't and I, and I just never I just don't believe that I think you know if you look at you know the work of Pollyanni and uh, his work on the 19th century and the Great Transformation, I mean, he makes the point that you know, the free market economy was created as a, a, as a political project. And essentially, the global economy that's been created in the last 40 years is a political project. And to say that it's somehow irreversible is the uh, absolute counsel of despair, I think. I think we do control our own destiny, and we should control our own destiny, which brings me on to the second question, are we the problem? Yeah, we are partly the problem. I think we are partly the problem, and we need to actually recognise the need for... I mean, you know, it's the same argument applies to the fight for, uh, uh, against, the, against climate change. You know, we have to recognise that we are, you know, we are part of the problem. We need to be part of the solution. So, yeah, I think that um, that, that is a perfectly valid poise, point. A crazy destruction. I mean, I don't see... Um, I don't see trade unions as part. I mean, yeah, they, they they are a vested interest, but to be frank, you know, neutering trade unions over the last thirty years and creating what's known as a sort of flexible labour market with all the or much more of the power in the hands of employers and much less power in the hands of employees doesn't seem to me to have actually done the trick. I mean, you know. The idea that wealth was going to trickle down, and that you know, by giving more, more, uh, more of the pie to, to capital, you would actually lead 
lead to higher investment and, and, and the profits would be recycled. And that, that, that model does not seem to have worked to me. Uh, I mean, I could, uh, we, we could talk about it later, but I mean, I, I think the, the, one of the fundamental problems of the economy is that wages as a share of, uh, of national income have gone down. Um, and that has not led to a, a burst of investment by, uh, by employers picking up a higher profit share. Uh, in terms of what the response is from, the, from central banks, I think central banks have pretty much reached the end of the, the road in terms of uh, plain vanilla policies. You know, they can reduce interest rates so they're negative, which the European Central Bank has done. But you're, essentially, you're pushing on a piece of string, I think. You can, so there are, two, there are two ways out of this, I think, for macro policy. One is the whole helicopter money, uh, deciding that you're going to have you know, tre the Treasury writing a cheque to everybody in the land for 500 quid or 1,000 quid, and the, and, the, and, the, and the central bank printing the money to pay for it. Or, 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 or the alternative for some form of green quantitative easing. Or treasuries say, we are going to have low interest rates for a long time. We can borrow more money at these very low rates of interest and use that money to, to invest in, in, in public sector projects, which I think is where uh, both main political parties here have got to. Both. But, but do you think that's going to then kickstart investment in the private sector, just so naturally? Because just giving people more money or just... Well, I don't. Th I mean, I, 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 mean, I, 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 I mean, I would not be in favour of the Treasury writing a cheque for five hundred pounds to everybody in the country and saying, using it like a Marks and Spencer's voucher, saying you have to spend this in the next three months or it becomes obsolete. Because one thing we don't have a problem with here is spending, spending money in the yeah. shops. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I would not be in favour of that. I think if you're going to use Q QE or you're going to borrow more money, you have to try and make it work for long-term productive purposes that you know the the, the 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 problem in a crisis is that governments then see gdp going through the floor they know that if you're going to build you know a new wind farm or a new a new high-speed railway to join all the big cities in the north or whatever you're going to use it for then you don't get any real return on that instantly and what they're looking for are instant solutions so what they tend to do is say you know what uh, the economy is in crisis the choice is do we spend it on long-term projects or do we spend it on a cut in VAT to get demand up well they get they, they do the they do the, they do the obvious short-term but wrong thing okay we're times against us so you might want to come back on some other points but I'll just take three more and then let Larry say what he wants to say at the end so there's the guy at the back yep and then oh, thank you so it seems to me that people's quantitative easing and the idea that the, the government should borrow while interest rates are low and so on um, is a bit like austerity. It's a flip side of austerity. It locates too much of the problem and the solution in the state sector. Isn't the big problem that we've got vast amounts of capital sloshing around the private financial system, which is not going into productive use? Nearly $300 trillion of assets, a lot of it in bubbles, assets, and so on. The question is, what policies do we need to force private capitalists to invest in productive growth. And are those policies possible inside the European Union? You mentioned capital controls, for example, not possible, as I understand it, while remaining in the EU. Since the crash, your solution, Larry, has been put to the test in the UK and Scotland. Interestingly, with uh, universal benefits, public investment projects, quite considerable, in fact, high public sector employment, green investment, and the Scottish Investment Bank, and the net result has been zero growth and life support system through the Barnett formula. I would suggest that that model just doesn't work because we've had the empirical evidence in our own country that it doesn't work. Um, in 2008, just after the crash at the Battle of Ideas, um, there was an economic session which was packed to the rafters and one of the uh, speakers said, looked at the room and said, everybody in this room is going to suffer as a result of what's just happened. We haven't really said much in the debate about the impact that a second crisis, which we see as largely inevitable, is going to have on ordinary people, but how do you picture it? Okay, and then... Um my apologies to those of you who have been trying to get in. This is our last floor um, speaker, Thank you, Larry. I think you're one of the bravest economists that I've ever read, and I read your articles regularly. Thank you very much. Um, for the new to arrive and to control our own destiny and investment, what can we do about the fact that most of Britain, 
the banks, the land, industry, etc., the public rail <coughs> utilities are not owned by Britain, but are owned by multinational companies and overseas governments. So yes. they're nationalised, but not by British, the British <laughs> government. And secondly, um, how, uh, how will Brexit help your aims um, regarding having some more control and controlling, and for the new to arrive, please? Huge question to ask you. I know it's not very fair, but please, can we have some little summary from you? Um, okay, uh, thank you all very much. Some very great questions. So, Larry, you've got a couple of minutes to pick up on what you want. Uh, Three minutes. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, it's kind of I, I, taking the last point first. I mean, it is it is somewhat bizarre. I think that you know we've privatised all these utilities and yet ended up with them being nationalised by companies from other other, other states. So, I um, mean. Larry, just a final Hold on, no, we've got very little time, sorry. Just one point. It breaks every rule in the new... Yeah, right, no, OK. I mean, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm quite gratified that I managed to get really through an hour without talking about <laughs> Brexit and my position yeah. on it, which is nice, really, because yeah, yeah. it's been most of change. my... It makes a nice change. I mean, my take on... And this goes to the, the first question. I think... The reason that I'm, I'm a sort of Lexiteer, left Brexiteer, is because I think that you know, the way forward is for nation states to actually take control of their own destiny. I mean, nation states are imperfect, uh, but they are still the locus of political activity and legitimacy uh, in a way that the European Union is not. I mean, and my other essentially essential criticism of the EU is that I don't see anything left-wing about it. I think it's, it's there really to further the interests of multinational capital uh, and you know it's it, everything it's done since in the last 25-30 years has been pro-capital uh, and anti-labour. So I, I, my, this is the, 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 to the first point, um, if we want to actually change the way in which UK capitalism works we start by saying you know what, we can change this ourselves, and the only way to change this is if we change this ourselves. And yeah, the, the, the going all the way back to you know, Ted Heath when he complained in the early 1970s, you know, he, he went to the IOD and said, we've done everything we possibly can to, 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 to make you invest, but you, you know, we've cut interest rates, we've increased, we've done this, we've done that, uh, but you still you won't invest. I mean, there is, a, there is a structural problem with the UK uh, private sector in terms of investment and so although it's not perfect you know one way is for the public sector to do it and try and crowd in private sector investment so that you get the ball rolling get the economy moving and and and, and you know essentially do what the Americans did with you know space program you know you had mission orientated finance saying our aim is to green the economy within the next 20 years in the way they wanted to put a man on the moon and once you start that process rolling you, you, you get private sector investment following in behind. I, 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 I don't know enough about the Scotland experience to give a, 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 a proper response to that question. I think uh, I, 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 maybe I should come up to Scotland and do a do a play. I haven't been to Scotland since the referendum uh, in 2014 so but I mean if, if that's the case that that's a pretty uh, sobering uh, state of affairs. Uh, last, last point. Last point. Um, I think one of the reasons that we're in the in the in the deep political and e as well as economic crisis is that the the wrong people suffered in. This is the question about who who suffers. The wrong people suffered in two thousand and eight, and one of the reasons I think that we are where we are on Brexit and why it caused such an amount of anger is that in 2008 the banks blew up the global economy and the people who suffered from that as a result the, 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 the policy response was tighten public sector spending cut welfare spending and the people who suffered were not the people who caused the crisis but people who had absolutely no responsibility for it and we are we, we, we sowed we sowed the wind then and we are we we are now reaping the whirlwind and if there's another crisis and the same thing happens again, then 
I really don't know what the... I, I, I dread to think what the political response is going to be. I think it will be a form of right-wing politics which will be very, very nasty. Uh, and so, you know, going back to your point, Phil, it would be great if people said, you know what, this is out there, this is, this is, uh, this is, a, this is a looming and potential threat. We need to actually take the action now rather than try and clean up what will be a terrible mess when it happens. Okay, so can we thank uh, Larry for...